Well, welcome to Vertical Church. We are so glad that you've decided to join us for our online experience today. Church, although we are not gathered together in person, we are still gathering under one accord, and that is to give God praise, is to worship Him. So let's sing it out. Let's give Him praise. Come on. Church, let's sing this out. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Yes, you have. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, we believe. He has done great things. Come on. Oh, Shiro of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every chapter and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. Church, isn't that true that we serve a God who has done great things? It says this in Ephesians. It says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly 
places far above all rule, all authority, all power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. We serve a God who is great church family. We serve a God who is high above every other name, one who is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And church, our prayer is that he would rule in our hearts, that he would rule in our lives, that we would not only have him at the right hand of the Father, but that he would be on the throne of our own lives. So as we worship today, let's, let's pray that, and let's worship his name, the one that is above every name, and let's put him on the throne. Sing it out. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, good, oh, let the key.
Amen. He is good. He's always good. In spite of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, even though our circumstances are always changing, the one we are worshiping this morning, he never changes. And he is good. That's why we've gathered across the triad and, and even across the country in our living rooms with, with an expectation this morning, an expectation that God is going to minister to us through these songs and through the word, and we are going to rejoice in him for what he's done for us because of Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to Vertical Church, Virtual Vertical. We're so glad that you chose to uh, join us this morning. If this is your first time, if you could do us this huge favor, grab your iPhone, grab an iPad, grab your laptop, go to verticalchurchconnect.org and, and register as a first-time guest. Let us know that you're checking us out. Uh, we are going to send you a note. We're going to give you a free gift. And I think it's going to be an encouragement to you. Church family, if you could do the same, let us know that you're here, that you're worshiping with us. On Vertical Church Connect, you'll have um, a sermon outline that you can follow along with this morning. Also have an opportunity to, to give as an act of worship right there through Vertical Church Connect. And really, it's that one-stop shop uh, for your worship needs this morning. Hey, I want to give a shout out to those of you, uh, those of you who came by here yesterday to pick up the green bag. What an awesome opportunity we have as a church family to minister to our community and to minister to their physical needs um, as people are going through trial. And um, if you were unable to stop by here yesterday, um, give us a call, come by this week, pick up a couple bags, fill those up. And of course, next Saturday, uh, you're gonna be dropping those off and we're gonna be getting them to the food shelters in our area. Let me pray, and then we're going to continue to worship. God, we are, we are so thankful uh, for the truth um, that we already sang about this morning. You are good. Thank you for being good to us, people who were not worthy. Yeah, you were kind. You were merciful. You were gracious. And you have brought us into relationship with you. For that, we're forever grateful. And that's why we can worship in the midst of the storm. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God.
the name above all names. Lord, we do worship you for what you've done, Lord, what you've accomplished. Father, I pray that our hearts would be postured in worship, but that we would be focused on that because you are worthy to be named the name that is above every name, the one who sits on the throne. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time of worship. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Vertical Church, I am excited to be sharing this text with you today. I, it's my hope that it's going to be just as convicting to your heart as it was to me as I was studying it this week. You know, being that I'm new on staff, you may not know that I'm a really big fan of the arts. In one way or another, I've been involved in the arts uh, since I was four years old. I've always enjoyed them. Now, my family and I recently relocated back to North Carolina from Colorado, where we were working in ministry for the past few years. And uh, one of the things that my wife and I got to do last summer was in Boulder, Colorado, they have a Shakespeare festival every summer. And that Shakespeare festival, um, it was just amazing. I mean, whatever aspect you think about the, the acting, the music, the sets, the costumes, the fact that it was in this beautiful amphitheater and while we were watching the show, the sun was setting in the sky. Every aspect of it was done with just great excellence. And through watching this, it kind of reawakened a love for Shakespeare in my heart that I hadn't realized had fallen asleep. Um, and through that reawakening, that rediscovering of Shakespeare's works, I stumbled upon the story of Macbeth. And most of you, many of you, have probably read Macbeth while you were in school. The basic gist of Macbeth is this. Macbeth is a Scottish general who receives a prophecy from a trio of witches that one day he is going to become the king of Scotland. 
And he wants to make sure that this prophecy comes true. So he and his wife partner up together. She's just as driven with ambition as he is. And they form a plan wherein he is going to assassinate the current king of Scotland, King Duncan. And so they do this, and he takes the throne for himself. And later he is racked with guilt, he's racked with paranoia, and he and his wife both end up dying. So basically it's a really good feel-good story, and it leaves a lot of warm and fuzzies in your heart. But what this story really delves into is the topic of ambition. And have you ever noticed the word ambition? It has this naturally negative connotation to it. it. The tone of the word ambition, it just makes you think of something negative. And why is that? I mean, the Oxford Dictionary defines ambition like this. It says it's a strong desire to do or to achieve something typically requiring determination and hard work. I mean, that doesn't really seem so bad on the face of it. You see, the story in Macbeth was really one about his character. Macbeth was driven to the point that his ambition made everything else unimportant. His character was questionable because he had become a slave to his ambition. It's not that ambition in of itself is a bad thing because it's not. But when it runs unchecked in our hearts, when it causes us to rise up in pride and run over everybody else, that's when it becomes a problem. Even worse, even worse when it causes us to disregard God's glory and instead seek our own glory, that's when, that's when we have to realign our hearts. And as followers of Jesus, our character matters. And the Bible definitely talks to what our character should look like. And so today, it's going to be good for us to look into our own hearts and see what kind of de character is developing in us. We all develop character traits over time. Some are going to be good, and some are going to be not so good. We need to look and see if something like ambition is running roughshod in our hearts and over the people around us. The good news is we don't have to guess at what this character should look like because we have Jesus as the model for what it should look like. So if you have your Bibles, let's open them to the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6, and the title of this sermon is Childlike. Now let's take a moment to get our bearings. The book of Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. It's the first of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life. And I think it's important that we take a quick pause even here and just remember what the word gospel means. It means good news. It's good news. It's good news that Jesus Christ, the only Son of God the Father, came down from heaven, took on the form of man to live with his creation, meaning all of us. And the reason this is good news is because it's the answer to the bad news we all face. The fact that sin has placed each of us in a position to owe a debt we could never repay. It created a chasm between us and God that we could never get across. But Jesus, but Jesus bridged the gap and he paid the debt so that we could have peace with God. And if you're listening today and you don't know this kind of peace, I want to tell you that this is available for you. It's as simple as receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior and committing to following him. He paid the price that we could never pay, and he offers us eternal life in him. It's the great exchange. It's our sin for his righteousness that's the gospel, and that is good news indeed. And so this book of Matthew is the first of four accounts of Jesus' life. This one is written by a Hebrew named Matthew, who was one of the 12 that followed Jesus in his earthly ministry. And Matthew's occupation was that he was a tax collector. Now you have to understand, understand something about the tax collectors. They were among the most hated members 
of Hebrew society. Not only were they collecting taxes on behalf of the Roman government, but they were also in this position to extort money from their own people for their personal gain. Can you imagine being in Israel and under the thumb of Rome's oppression, and here is one of your own people capitalizing on this plight. The tax collectors were not only thieves, but traitors to their own people. But listen, this is an interesting insight as to the kind of person that God would use for his purposes. Yes, Matthew was a sinner. And yes, he was a traitor to his people. And yes, he was called to leave all that money and all that lifestyle behind and follow Jesus. And there's a good reminder in this for all of us. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. If we obey God's call on our lives, he can and will use us for his purposes and for his glory. And as we approach this chapter, there's some other interesting things to notice about where we are in the story. At this point, Jesus is not very far from the cross. Peter, James, and John have just recently witnessed Jesus being transfigured in front of their eyes. In that moment, he was momentarily not just visible as a man, but in his divine glory. That must have been some kind of knockout moment to observe. And shortly after this, we see that Jesus is explaining to his disciples the fact that he's going to be delivered to the wicked authorities, that he's going to go to the cross and be killed, and that he's going to rise again in three days. So let's pick up the story right there and start reading in Matthew 18, verse one. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, excuse me, whoever causes one of these to believe, that believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, as we read through this text, we see an interesting exchange between Jesus and the disciples where they're like, hey man, in the coming kingdom, who's, who's going to be awesome and get to sit next to you? Their struggle with pride was showing through in ambition and was driving them to ask this strange question and Jesus responds like, guys, let me, let me show you the way you ought to be. Which brings us to our big idea for today, which is this. Followers of Jesus need to grow in Christ-like character. Followers of Jesus need to grow in a Christ-like character. This Christ-like character, it's not something we just fall off the truck fully formed. No, in fact, it's something that we have to grow and develop in over time. We're going to continue to grow and develop this over the entirety of of our Christian walk, but it's something we need to be regularly and consistently growing in. We need to know where the target is that we're shooting for. We need to know the direction that we're heading in. And here in the passage, we see Jesus describe three instructions for our character. He gives us the direction. So the, the first instruction we see is this. Be humble in your attitude. Be humble in your attitude. In verse 1 it says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus asking who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we just talked about that back in chapter 17, he told them he was going to the cross. He had kind of thrown down the gauntlet on what servant leadership is going to look like. Kind of like you want to be a leader, that's a good thing, but this is the kind of sacrifice that it takes. And for us, after the fact, it's really easy for us to look at these disciples and say, hey, dummies, how did you miss this? Why are you asking him a question like this? But 
then again, we do have the benefit of hindsight. And if I'm honest with myself, I probably would have been just as thick-witted and just as slow and just as dumb to miss the point as well. Back in chapter 17, it says that they were greatly distressed by the news that Jesus would go to the cross. And that was a good response, but unfortunately that, short, that response was short-lived. Now, as we get into this text, it says Jesus was using the language of um, kingdom of heaven. And this was a common theme in Matthew. Throughout the gospel, we see Jesus making the case that Jesus is indeed the Messiah and the king that Israel had been waiting for, that they had been praying for. That this Jesus, this Jesus, was the fulfillment of all these promises in the Old Testament. And so Jesus tells them, truly, I tell you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. These guys were looking to be elevated in this new kingdom. They wanted to be like major players in the new power structure. They wanted to be like made men. And then Jesus picks up a child and he says, look at this child here. You need to be more like this. And this is so counterintuitive because when it comes to children, that's not who we usually think of when we're thinking about who's greatest in a power structure or in a social structure. We often, if we admit it, we often respond to our children with something a little more like, quiet down, honey. The adults in the room are talking. I remember one night, um, several years back, Melissa and I were watching a show on TV, and it was this um, crime and uh, murder. It was this uh, uh, a mystery, and we were really engaged. We were both engrossed in the story. We were trying to, in fact, we were competing with one another to see who could figure out the ending of the story first. Had some really good complex twists and turns. And um, at one point in the story, the screen started flashing with text messages between these two cell phones. And the last text message was in a different language. In fact, that last text message was in Latin. And I was really quite proud of myself because I was like, yeah, babe, that's, that's Latin. I'm pretty smart to be able to identify that for you. Kind of rose up in my own pride a little bit. And the fact that I could tell you that it was in another language didn't do anything for the fact that I could not tell you what it had to say. At this point, our daughter... Emmy, who was then nine years old, well, she was, she was sitting on the couch with us. She wasn't really watching the show. She was kind of engrossed on her iPad playing a game. But she chimed in at this point. She says, hey, Daddy. And she proceeded to try to tell me something. Of course, I'm on the other end of the couch on my cell phone on Google trying to translate what the Latin said. Um, not really my best dad moment of listening to my daughter and she tried again. She said, hey, Daddy, let me tell you something. And finally, on a third try, she says, hey, Daddy. And I, I stopped what I was doing, and I turned, and I said, yes, honey. What did you want to tell me? Well, Emmy's had the good fortune of attending a classical school that had been teaching her Latin since third grade. So at the ripe old age of nine, she proceeded to correct my mispronunciation, translate the phrase for me, and I think she even started conjugating some of the verbs, at which point I just explained to her she was purely showing off and trying to make daddy look bad. The point is we were dismissing, I was dismissing her input straight away, purely on the fact that she was a child, that she was a kid. And so you can imagine the confusion that the disciples experienced as Jesus told them, you need to be more like a child. Firstly, let's look at what he was not saying. He wasn't saying that children are pure or innocent or without sin because that's untrue. The fact of the matter is we're all born into sin, right? Right? We don't have to learn to be sinful. No, we're guilty right from the get-go. Psalm 51, 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And similarly, Romans 3, 10 says, None is righteous, no, not one. So what was Jesus saying 
with this. He was saying in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need to become like a child. He is physically holding a child up and saying, this is the example. You need to approach me in a childlike manner. We need to approach with more humility in our attitude, with much less concern for our social status. Jesus is not advocating for childishness of thought, but instead he's pointing out that humility of mind comes with childlike trust. And that is the reminder for each of us here today to say, am I approaching my king with this kind of trust? Am I approaching him with my own agenda up front? Or am I coming to him with the humility to realize that his way is better? His way is better. His way is always better. Isaiah 55, 8 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's plan is always better than ours. Not that we get excused to sit on our hands and do nothing. That's not what it means to be humble. It's not being passive. What it does mean is we need to submit to his leadership We need to be willing to jettison our plan for his plan. We need to approach him as a child. So the first instruction in building a Christ-like character we see is to be humble in your attitude. And the second instruction we see is to be welcoming in your relationships. Be welcoming in your relationships. So the direction of the focus changes here a bit. In verses 2 to 4, we were examining our character as it relates to approaching God. But now the focus is on how do we approach others. Back in our text, Jesus says in verse 5, And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. It's, It's always a good thing for us to be asking questions of the text. God doesn't mind us when we don't, he doesn't mind when we don't understand. He's not worried when we ask questions of the text. And so, one question I had in this portion of the text is this. Who are the children that we are to be welcoming? Who is Jesus referring to? He's not referring to literal children here, but he's referring to children as was defined in previous verses. In other words, who he's referring to is those who humble themselves and become like children. Those are Jesus' true disciples. And this is an important distinction to make here because they're not welcomed based on who they are. No, they're welcomed because they come in Jesus' name. So it's not based on merit or anything they've accomplished. It's not because they're great. It's not because they're wise or mighty, but it's because they belong to Jesus. To take it even further, Jesus says that when we're welcoming to him, his disi- I mean, when we're welcoming to his disciples, we are, in fact, welcoming him. We see this back a few chapters in ten- chapter 10 when he says, whoever gives, this, whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, truly, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. So it's counted to us as hospitality to Jesus when we're welcoming to others. Continuing in verse 5, the the word in the verse here um, that, that I wanted to highlight is receives. It's really, I mean, it's a pretty easy word to understand. It means to deliberately and readily take something or someone to oneself. The term was used for welcoming an honored guest and with meeting their needs with kindness. When anyone welcomes a Christian as an honored guest and friend, he is in fact welcoming Jesus in that same way. I was thinking back to the other day when I was 17 years old, because at the time I was pursuing a career in the arts, I was found myself living in Budapest, Hungary, and I was over there for a few years to advance my studies. And this one spring at the end of my first year there, I had the opportunity to do some training in Italy. And I needed to take a train back from Italy 
to Germany in order to take a flight back to the United States for my sister's wedding. Now, being that I was 17, I'll admit I was not super mature. Um, and I had this plane ticket in hand, but I hadn't done a good job of budgeting my money. So in my 17-year-old head, I had calculated that I needed to hang on to about 100 bucks for the train ride from Italy to Germany and then to get to the airport. So I got on the train, and it didn't cost $50 to take the train ride back to Germany. It actually was going to cost something closer to $150. And so... I started thinking about, like, I only have $100, and I have other expenses I need to think about. I have to get this train ride. I have to get the bus from the train station to the airport. What am I going to eat in the next 24 hours? So I started working through all this stuff, and I kind of panicked a bit. I started thinking to myself, well, I don't actually have enough money for this train ticket I'm already on a train somewhere in the middle of the Italian countryside, and this conductor's probably going to kick me off. I started thinking to myself, how am I going to find a phone and make a phone call back to the United States? Remember, this is not, there were no cell phones at this time. You actually had to go to a phone booth and dial a number there. Um, I started thinking to myself, where am I going to stay tonight? How will I ever get back to my plane? Well, there was a lady that was sitting in the compartment with me. She was either Austrian or German. I never found out, but she spoke great English. And for some unknown reason, she reached into her purse and she pulled out enough money. In fact, she pulled out more money than I needed for my train ride back to Germany. She didn't know me. She didn't know my story, and certainly she could have chosen to ignore the whole exchange and just read the book that she was reading. But instead, she took it upon herself to offer this kind of radical hospitality to some dumb American kid who had gotten on a train without enough money. I'll never forget it. To this day, it's still such a vivid memory to me. And every time I think of Italy, man, I think of warm welcoming people. Think if the church of Jesus Christ was this way. What would it look like if we were to practice this kind of hospitality to other believers? What would it look like if we were to be this warm to other believers who don't think exactly the same way that we do? What would it look like if we were this welcoming to a lost and a hurting world? As I say this to you, I feel all kinds of conviction in my own heart about it. This is a message I'm preaching to myself as well. What if, what if I got over my own hesitancy to be hospitable and instead am tempted to grow in my willingness to be the hands and the feet of our Lord? If you're like me, maybe hospitality is not your spiritual gift. And that's okay. Maybe we just step out of our comfort zones and start to offer this kind of warmth and care to the people that God places in our path. What, an ama what amazing things we could accomplish in this way. So the basic truth of verse 5 is that it's impossible to separate Jesus from his followers. Being, a, being hospitable to other Christians, it's equivalent to being hospitable to Jesus himself. And I can say with all honesty, that this is something that my family and I have experienced in great abundance since coming here to Vertical Church. You are a warm and a welcoming church, and we're so grateful to be a part of this family. So we've been examining these three, these, uh, three instructions for building Christ-like character. Number one is to be humble. Number two was to be hospitable. And number three, the third instruction for our character is to be careful in your actions. Be careful in your actions. Let's look back at our text into verse six. So we just read the promise in verse five, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. 
But then we get the flip side. We get this stern warning in verse 6, which says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I don't know about you, but that kind of runs a chill down my spine. That's not a real encouraging piece of the text. Instead, he's clearly saying that whoever mistreats a Christian is also mistreating Christ. The millstone that Jesus is talking about, he's talking about the, the upper millstone that would be a part of the grinding process, and, and it would be grinding, and there would be a donkey making it circulate. And these stones would often uh, weigh up to hundreds of pounds. The Romans would sometimes use this form of execution. They would tie that stone around the neck of a criminal and then drop them into the deep water. And this form of execution, it was unimaginably horrific to the Hebrews. And this picture was probably super jarring for the disciples who were just before this arguing about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. They were not only sinning because they were indulging in pride and boasting, they were baiting one another towards anger and envy. And so this is a warning to both believers and unbelievers. The little ones he's referring to here in verse 6 is once again referring to followers of Jesus. He's saying, whoever causes one of my followers to sin, that's better for him to be drowned in the sea. The warning is to anyone who might entice, lure, or influence a believer to stumble and fall into sin. And there are both direct and indirect ways that we can cause others to sin. One of the most classic, minds, uh, classic stories that you can think of is in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. Eve took the fruit, she ate, and as soon as she was done, she turned around and gave it to Adam, who also followed suit. Or how about Exodus 32? As soon as Moses took up the mountain, the people started clamoring for a physical idol. And so Aaron says, right, give me your gold, I'll build you one. But surely we can think of current day examples of leading another into the sin. I mean, maybe it's the husband who says to his wife, yeah, honey, we don't, we don't really qualify for this tax uh, exemption, but we're going to put it in here anyways. No one will know. Or maybe it's the parents that so favor one child that the other siblings rise up in anger from total exasperation, right? Think Ephesians 6, 4. Do not provoke your children to anger. And there are many other examples we can think of of how we can intentionally or unintentionally lead another believer into sin. And Jesus says, be careful. He says, be careful. He says, it would be better to be thrown into the sea and what he's saying here is it would be better to go ahead and die now because it would save us from committing the detestable act of leading another into sin. So, true confession time here. I have a bit of a workaholic tendency. It's in my nature to be either 100% on or 100% off. And when I'm on, I am focused, I am tenacious in the task. And this usually works out to be a really good thing for my employers, but it's not always the healthiest thing for me or for my family. In recent years, I went through a particularly hard season of ministry. And so the temptation was for me to just bear down and grind my way through it. And that was a fail to begin with. Because here's the thing, God has wired us to need to both work and to rest. I simply was not resting. And it manifested so much strain in our marriage that it was causing my wife to grow angry and to grow discontent. My sin of overworking had the unintended consequences of driving my wife 
toward sinful behavior as well. Praise the Lord that he eventually opened my eyes to my failings. And praise the Lord also that my wife is very forgiving. But I had to repent of this tendency to overwork. And now this is something we know that I have a tendency with and we check in with each other and we talk about it on a regular basis. And so it's my hope that this illustrates the fact that we often do not intentionally lead others to sin. In fact, it's really the intentional stuff that's the easiest to identify. I mean, I can imagine we, we, could, we could say that we haven't really led anyone lately to break the Ten Commandments. Like, I haven't led anyone this week to commit murder. Or I didn't lead anyone this week to commit adultery. The, the big sins are much easier to identify and to defend against. But it's the unintentional sins that are the most dangerous because they're the ones that we don't usually see. They're the hardest to identify. Maybe even think about what Pastor Matt was talking about a few weeks ago where he was talking about the so-called acceptable sins. And so we need to be on our guard. We need to be vigilant. We need to be careful. The fact that Jesus gave us this dire warning means it's something we should be paying attention to. It's something that he considers to be important. The default position is obviously to focus on the sin that we are committing ourselves, and we should be doing this, but we also need to consider how our character is affecting others. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant as yourselves. This is a great description of the kind of character Jesus wants to grow in each of us, which brings us back to the big idea. Followers of Jesus need to grow in Christ-like character. I said it at the beginning of our time, that character isn't something that just happens in a moment, because it doesn't. It grows and forms over time. It's something that develops with intentionality. And it requires us to examine our own hearts on a regular basis to evaluate how we are actually doing. And let me give you a practical evaluation tool to use as well. Ask the people who know you best. Ask the people around you How am I doing in developing Christ-like character? And be specific. Say, how am I doing in humility? How am I doing in being welcoming? But make sure you are willing to receive the feedback that they're going to give you if you are truly close to them. These will be some of the best people that will be positioned to give you this kind of honest feedback. Secondly, spend time in the word. The more we renew our minds in the word, the more we're going to be ambitious for God's glory instead of our own. Jesus wants us to be humble in our attitude. It's our, it's our tendency to become so driven with ambition that we rise up in, in pride. And Jesus says we need to be humble like a small child. Our God is a heavenly father and we should rightly approach him as a little child would he also wants us to be welcoming in our associate in our relationships for some of this is easy because hospitality is your love language but hospitality welcoming it doesn't have to be your spiritual gift in order to do it well but it does require placing others as a priority over yourself And finally, he wants us to be careful in our actions. Because of grace and because of the cross, we have a lot of liberty in our lives. But Jesus gives us the warning to be careful how we use that freedom. We do have liberty, but we do not have license to cause others to sin. And if we put ourselves in that mindset of putting God and others before ourselves, then God can use us for his purposes and for his glory. Amen? Let's pray.
Father, I just thank you. I thank you for the example of Jesus. I thank you that you showed us through his life what a Christ-like character looks like. Father, I pray that this conviction that I feel, I pray that our hearts would be changed, that we would allow ourselves to be molded and shaped into the followers that you would have us to be. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, God. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes. the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever
day of worship. What a challenge we were given today as followers of Jesus to grow in Christ-like character. And the best way that you can grow in Christ-like character is by building on the rock, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Michael, for that challenge today. Thank you for feeding our souls. Um, the one thing that really jumped out at me is um, this idea of being welcoming in our relationships. Take that home with you, church. This week, we're in the midst of this COVID crisis. We're hunkered down in our homes. Open yourself up to your neighborhood. On your walk, stop, engage, pray. How can I pray for you? How are you really doing? Invite them into your yard for bonfire. Social distance, of course. But man, Christ-like character. Minister to people. Be welcoming in relationships. That was my takeaway. Thank you, Michael, again. 1 Peter 5, 9 and 10 is, is our benediction, or 10 and 11, excuse me, is our benediction today. And after you have suffered a little while, you know, after you have suffered a little while, get this, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, get this, restore confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Vertical Church, you are loved and you are sent.